Ryan Koppelman, greetings. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Richard. How are you, man? First of all, all anybody should be saying to you is, it's an honor to speak to the man who has the best tweet of 2020. <laughs> Which one is that? I think you know. I mean, we don't have to. We don't have to work blue here in this setting. <laughs> oh, why not? Why the fuck not? You know what I'm saying? Right. Well, Dude, thank you. I mean, that was incredible. You must have laughed your balls off because it was 3:30 in the morning when you woke up the next morning, and you were trending at the top of Twitter. Did, did you not find that hilarious? Yes. Well, it, it's happened a couple of times. The first time it happened was like a year and a half ago when I did a, a tweet about when Trump misspoke. Yes. And I said. I misspoke. I actually won't be right here waiting for you. And I tweeted it and it was kind of, we were in Mexico actually on vacation. And I, I hit tweet and I laid back down. We were about to go to sleep and I, and I just reached over to Daisy and I held her hand and I said, I think I just did a good tweet. Well, I woke up the next morning, I woke up the next morning with my manager calling me going, dude, you're trending. It's just it's fun, funny. you know, you know, like when you, as a writer, and that creative outlet, sometimes when you just sort of like, oh, that was a good one. It's kind of like when I nail a lyric in a verse or you write a great line in a script. Of course. No, it's great. It's um, because Twitter has these, th this word limit, you have to, uh, to do that well and to kind of catch what that tone is. Yeah. It does take a kind of like connecting to the zeitgeist for a second. Totally. And you do sometimes know when that happens. But sometimes stuff on, on Twitter takes you a little by surprise, like this whole thing that I've been doing, trying to bring people together by having this morning coffee together. You know, I call the yeah. first cup of coffee in the morning the Royale. Yeah. And uh, I just posted a picture of myself, a friend of mine, my friend Tom Kretschmer was this great guy. He was like, you should have, um, you should encourage people to post pictures. But I didn't think people would really. And now I get hundreds every day um, yeah. in the morning people. And I could tell all these people that are like kind of freaking out that they're connecting to each other and sharing this moment because we're so apart that for everybody to be like, hey, I'm a human being. I like to have my coffee in the morning. And some people have their kids in the picture or they'll be their lucky mug or their favorite shirt or their favorite spot. They're having a bad day and they want me to see that. And um, I, you know, the fact that it's now like, um, uh, roll, that has this momentum is great, but th that was an example. I didn't know if three people were going to do it. I, I was surprised by what happened. Yeah, but isn't that a beautiful thing? It, 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 these, these ways that, that are connecting us again in, in the most basic, yep. simple morning coffee. There's a great example, you know? Because if it's something, if it's something higher, in, in terms of higher learning than that, a bunch of people are going to be like, fuck it, like, you know? Yeah, as opposed to just being like really... Hey, I want someone to look, as you know, because you're a famous person for a long time, what people want, and it's why I, I always think it's why Jim Cameron's uh, avatar is so brilliant, even though sometimes people don't, all people want is to be seen. And so when someone sees you a fan of yours, it's not, oh, I saw Richard Marks, that's great. But what they want is you to notice them. Yeah. Notice. And sometimes, and sometimes I notice them because they say something so kind and so, um, just put in a way that's just so, just like when I meet people at gigs or at restaurants or in elevators or whatever, and somebody will say, you know, I just, oh, this is so cool that I'm meeting you because, you know, I, we used your song at the, whatever. I mean, when, I, when people react, you know, interact with me that way, it's just so kind. And, exactly. and much like, you know, in, on the opposite end, there are some people that just want to get your attention by being assholes. Totally. You know? so that, that never bothered, that part doesn't bother me. No, and you, you handle trolls really well too. I, I, I just find that funny always. Uh, but, but yes, when someone, uh, when you can tell, because you know what it's like. I, I, I know the first time I met David Mamet, uh, I just wait, wanted wait, to Wait, wait, wait. First of all, the, the first time. Well, I met him a few times. I don't know him, but I met him a few oh, times. Oh, but I mean, it's so, how cool is it to be able to say, well, you know, the first time I met David Mamet. No, it's true. I have a note from him hanging in my office. I've hung there for on. 20 years. But the first time I met him, I, you know, you just want the person to know how much it's meant to you. Of course, you can never, can, it's impossible really to communicate it. But you just hope that they'll pick up like, hey, I know everybody's like, I know it's worked for a lot of people what you do. But like, like for me, David Mamet's like a, I don't think you know, my whole, basically the whole direction of my life probably shifted when yeah. uh, I saw House of Games or something like sure. that. Or when I saw um, one of his shows, you know, on, on, on Broadway. Yeah. The first time, well, not the first time, the, the one single solitary time 
that I was fortunate enough to meet Peter Gabriel. Oh my God. So had, had only come out maybe three or four months before. Um, I was Which record had come out three or four months before? So, the album So. Oh yeah, So. Perfect record. Which I, I remember standing, there was, a, there was a record store on Melrose Avenue. Um, I think it was at like the corner of, I wanna say like Sweets or maybe, or uh, anyway, there was this really cool kind of hipster record store in, and this would have been 1986. And I remember going, parking and standing outside the record store before they opened at 10 a.m. to make sure that they didn't run out of, because it, it, was, it was the release day. I was such a Peter Gabriel freak and still am. Yeah, you were a Salisbury Hill. Like you were a huge fan yeah. of like the Peter Gabriel albums before. So yes, yeah. all the Peter Gabriel albums, the which are called yeah. Peter Gabriel. Yeah. Um, so anyway, that album, particularly on top of all the, the 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 work that he'd done prior to that, that album hit me so hard and affected me so deeply and was so inspiring. And I was making my first album at the time, and so a few months later, I'm in this restaurant. And he and a group of people walked in and, and I, I just, I didn't know what to do. I froze. And the person I was with saying, you knew I was a huge fan. And, and she said, you got to go over and say something. And I said, no, I can't. I like, I, even at 22, whatever I was, it's like, don't meet your heroes. It's always going to be. Finally, she persuaded me to this go over. And I started to walk over and I'm thinking, what the fuck am I going to say to him? Right. And he sort of, I hung back cause he was, in conversation, I didn't want to interrupt, but he kind of looked at me like, what are you doing? You know, and I said, I'm so sorry. I don't mean to interrupt you. And I, it came to me as I, as I walked up to him, I said, I just want to thank you for making music. Perfect. He got up from the table. He gave me the warmest handshake. He put his hand on my shoulder. He said, man, that's such a kind thing to say. Oh, What's great. your name? And then we, you know, he engaged with me for a minute or two and wished me luck on my record. And and was so kind. Oh, that's great. You told him that your first record was coming out? He asked me, he said, are you a musician? And I said, yeah, I'm actually making my first album for EMI right now. And, and he was like, oh, congratulations, man. I hope it goes great. And I mean, but I think had I said, you know, I know I work at, at the lumber yard or whatever, he still would have been like, he just seems like a gracious man. Yeah. And, and that album, I, I will say if people, it's, it's so funny, the guys our age, that album is forever. You know, it's one of the, it, it was one of the, the, the sort of albums that was both enormously commercially successful and also enormously critically regarded, almost like Graceland or something. Yeah. Uh, but when you think of it, every single song on that record, man, including like Don't Give Up is just like the third Don't song. It's amazing, album. but it's the, some of the tracks like Mercy Street, that song. Every song. Annihilates me. And Red Rain. Forget uh, about it. Red Rain, I, even to this day, if, especially if it's been a while since I've heard Red Rain, if I'm in my car and I put it up in my car and I listen to it completely undistracted from beginning to end, I react to it, maybe not the same way, because the first time I heard it, I wept. Like it made me sob. And I didn't even know what the fuck he was talking about. Right. Oh, it, really? I didn't really get it. Right. It was just the sheer emotion of his voice and his delivery and the, and the, the track and the music and the playing it was just so it So funny how sometimes a record like that like even if it's not your very favorite group, like I'm a you, I love you too, but they're not. If I had to list my ten favorite bands, they wouldn't be one of my ten right. favorites. Close, but not really my ten favorites. But the first time I heard "With or Without You," I yeah. remember exactly where I was and what it did. Any time I hear that, so especially like you said, if it hasn't been for a while, any time I hear that song, I'm snapped right into it again. Yeah. You know? Have you ever heard Miracle Drug by YouTube? What album? No, what album is that on? It was from, um, I think it's from either. The, I, I'm like what the, era? Just what era? Oh, it's on the same, I think it's on the same album as Elevation and Vertigo. Oh, sure. Thing. Late. Yeah, yeah late later version. on. Like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know, because I was going to say, I know like their first five albums backwards and forwards. Yeah. But uh, listen to after Achtung Baby, I know it much less after Achtung Baby. It's two, two out. No, it's like four albums after Achtung Baby, which is my favorite U2 album. Yeah. But dude, go listen to Miracle Drug. I will. And, and I think you'll be like, holy shit, I didn't realize this one was there. Yeah, no, um, I'll totally do that. I, so I, I have to ask you this because uh, and for anybody that's watching that doesn't know, Brian Koppelman, aside from being just an articulate, wonderful, cool dude, 
Thanks, brother. showrunner, executive producer, and writer of an incredible series on Showtime called Billions. Uh, you've done many other things, but that's your focus right, right. now. Um, Billions has season five starts in season May. five starts May third. The trailer was uh, put out today. Trailers yeah, online yeah, yeah. today. Yeah. So you have to check it out. I'm I'm uh, I can't watch the trailer because I'm still in the beginning of season. You're a couple three. seasons behind, right? Can't watch. The, I saw the trailer and I got looked so excited and I was like, oh, I can't watch it because I don't want to. I told you when you were on my when you were on my. my my podcast, I told you, I love getting your notes as you're a couple seasons behind when you're like, oh my God, this is so, yeah, that's great. I love it. You, you have to see this show. Everybody, you have to watch Billions. It's so fucking great. Thanks. So, and for when I know about you, you're a very disciplined, deliberate creator of words. You, you write, you have times that you write, you have circumstances within which you like to write, I believe. Has this self-isolation social distancing thing been uh, inspiring for you? Has it hampered you at all? Is it completely just business as usual? Well, this week, there are certain things I always do. I always meditate. I always do morning pages in the morning to get journaling, to get myself going. We've been having writer's room meetings on Zoom, like nine of us and you know, uh, all of us on, on Zoom together talking about the last couple episodes of the season. I'm not beating myself up a few things. One, my circumstance during this and as yours is, there are people who, for whom this is, for the most people, I think, this is a seismic oh, disruption in their lives. And awesome. that's why it's great that you're doing this. It is, the rugs have been pulled out from under them and I'm, I'm so moved by the stories and I'm so worried for people and I just want to, Put my arms around people if I if I can. So me too because we're I can't so, really, dude. We're so lucky. We are so lucky. That's what I'm saying. I can't really live in the, like the disruption of my schedule. Like right. I'm I'm lucky enough that you know, you know what I mean. I'm I'm lucky enough that I get to do this thing that I do that I love. It's already a dream job. It's a job that I don't have to go to an office. Like I can do my job wherever I am. Yeah. I'm not. I'm I'm so. You know I've had years that have been weird and difficult, but the last few haven't, and I'm in a really good spot. But it is still psychically such a mind fog yeah. that it's not like I've written a ton of pages this week and I'm forgiving myself for it. But yeah. I am very, as you say, I am somebody who has the rhythm and I'll be right back in it again by Monday. Like this week, I just said to myself, don't put pressure on yourself. Don't force that. Like settle into all this. Get used to what right. you're dealing with, right? right? I'm not in my house. I rented a house somewhere outside of New York. I, I live in Manhattan. Yeah. So I'm like... I'm I'm like uh, with my family, just getting used to this. But yeah, I will go right back into producing pages, doing my work. Right. One thing I've been doing is I've been reading a lot, Richard, because I find that reading, particularly reading fiction, I rotate, but reading fiction makes you shut the TV off, makes you shut off the internet, and yeah. makes you allow your inner self to kind of shift into that other place. Reading but, is unlike anything else for me in that it is so, uh, so, so there's so such beautiful solitude in it. Yes, it's immersive, yeah. right? You have to, unless you're, unless you're listening to a, to an audio book, you, it's not something you do with somebody else. You, you, you dive into a book alone and you, you get absorbed by yourself. It's some, it's such a solitude, solitude. Yeah, and then, and you're, well, and it, it, I think it, um, it causes real, real shifts in you. So, that's been a great thing. I've been trying to read for a couple hours a day. So that's. Did you check out that book? I'm I, not, did, I, did you check out that writer I texted you about? Not yet, but I will. Alan Folsom. Yeah, I'm looking to see if you. Oh, did you text me like the day after our podcast or something? Yeah. Shit went oh, crazy. No. I mean. I texted you to, like two days ago when you, you tweeted something about it. I want books to read. Oh, all right. I'll find it. Yeah. I'll find it. Alan, I'll read it. I have like a stack of them. I have a stack of books now from that, but he only um, wrote, I think, four or five novels. Right, I remember you said that. Three of them. Um, he passed away uh, young. Um, he, I, I, I just loved his his fiction writing so much. I think you would too. Um, all right, I'll do it. If, yeah, yeah. if you love it, I'll do it for sure. How are you um, getting through all this? Are you managing okay? Oh yeah, I mean, I, we're great, and I and I again, like you just said, you know, my my only anxiety is about other people. You know, and not even like I'm, 
I'm in, a, I guess, a constant state of worry a little bit for, I have three grown sons right. who are being very responsible and have been pretty responsible. I have an 84 year old mother who's pretty much just holed up and she's not letting anybody near her and she's doing fine. She's stocked up. She's good. Yeah. I got my dad who, you know, my dad, I got my dad to go to a house, his house and stay and good. fully. But yeah. I mean, there's definitely an, a, an element of uh, concern about them. That's different. That I, I'm not worried about D Daisy and I are very clear about the last time we were anywhere near anyone and we're, we're fine. Right. But like you said, especially when you, if you watch what's going on, I'm getting more of my news from social media these days than anywhere else. And I'm constantly reading all different points of view and all different kinds of things. And it's just everything from people who are sick, who've got it, to people who still have to go to work because their employers will not let them stay home. Uh, Monstrous, these man. These people that Monstrous. are being forced to be around potentially sick people, which is breaking my heart. I'm getting letters from people. I'm getting emails from people saying, what should I do? You know, just people who are fans or whatever saying like my yeah. bosses are making people come into work. And I can't say to them, tell your boss to go fuck himself because oh. this is this person's livelihood. So it's like, well, try to advocate and agitate the best you can yeah. and measure the various things. But uh, if you're a boss, if you are somebody running a, a venture right now and you're a Richard Marx fan and you're watching this thing, do the right thing. Uh, because history will not judge you kindly if you're someone who's demanding uh, that your employees work from home. Set up a way for them to work on Zoom like this. Yeah. You can really accomplish a lot this way. Absolutely. Um, you know, I got, a, I got a text a couple hours ago from a guy that I know that has always been very kind to me. His name is Camille, and he, he owns and runs, um, I think there are three or four L.A.-based uh, places they're called blue jam cafe it's a really great restaurant and he's now branched out he's got them in one in southeast asia now and he's doing he's done really well but he texted me today i haven't talked to him in a long time um but he said he's laid off 300 people and and, and he said you know it, it and it's it's broken his heart he, this is such a lovely compassionate guy he treats his people so well and he's like i can't I, like i I don't know what else to do. I had to lay off 300 people. Like it's no, just my friends in the uh, restaurant business are feeling the same way. It's brutal. Yeah. I'm trying to try my best to support. I'm trying to, I'll, in the next few days, I'll be trying to raise some money for the food bank of New York, yeah. which is what I always do. Those are the things that was, that was, that's how I wanted to end this with you. Is like, um, what are some things that you suggest? I know that, I mean, and you should follow Brian on Twitter because he's awesome. He's a great follow, but, um, what are you telling people, whether they're fans or just people, you know, friends of yours, like what's, what are the, what's the silver lining here? What, what can we do that's, that's, that's positive? One, be kind to yourself, especially in this kind of situation. Yeah. Don't overburden yourself. Don't put too much pressure on. We're all going to make some kind of mistakes. Uh, so be kind. And I think to yourself, and then it's really hard to be anxious when you're in the process of helping somebody else. So, if you can do something to give a piece of yourself, reach out, literally a phone call. A couple friends of mine who are really never phone call people have said like getting phone calls during this time means something. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm probably going to, because of this thing, like I was talking about the Royale where we all have our morning coffee together on Twitter. So someone suggested that I make mugs that say the Royale with a goofy picture of myself on them and sell them for the charity. So I think I'm going to do that. I'm just going to. That's a great idea. Yeah, it's funny, right? Everyone will have these mugs and all, every dollar will go to charity. I'll let someone else do it. They can just yeah. go do it. Yeah. Um, and uh, any little, any little, I think these, this, since we're all isolated, any way you can just reach a hand out. That's why it's great that you're doing this and sort of just hold somebody's hand is a really wonderful thing. And I think that's what people should be doing. Yeah. Good, good man. Good Thank Richard. you, Brian. You're such Amen. a cool guy. I'm so glad that we're kind of in touch now. And Me too, dude. And when this uh, craziness is over, we have to go hang. We will. I'll talk and to you soon. Be safe and take care of your family and give my love to your dad. Be well, Richard. Bye. Bye-bye.